Chapter 2. On Board the Dawn Treader. Ah, there you are, Lucy, said Caspian. We were just waiting for you. This is my captain, the Lord Drinian. A dark-haired man went down on one knee and kissed her hand. The only others present were Reepicheep and Edmund. Where is Eustace? asked Lucy. In bed, said Edmund. And I don't think we can do anything for him. It only makes him worse if you try to be nice to him. Meanwhile, said Caspian, we want to talk. By Jove, we do, said Edmund. And first, about time. It's a year by our time since we left you just before your coronation. How long has it been in Narnia? Exactly three years, said Caspian. All going well? asked Edmund. You don't suppose I'd have left my kingdom and put to sea unless all was well, answered the king. It couldn't be better. There's no trouble at all now between Telmarines, dwarfs, talking beasts, fawns, and the rest. And we gave those troublesome giants on the frontier such a good beating last summer, they pay us tribute now. And I had an excellent person to leave as regent while I'm away. Trumpkin, the dwarf. You remember him? Dear Trumpkin, said Lucy, of course I do. You couldn't have made a better choice. Loyal as a badger, ma'am, and valiant as a... as a mouse, said Drinian. He had been going to say as a lion, but noticed Reepicheep's eyes fixed on him. And where are we headed for? asked Edmund. Well, said Caspian, that's rather a long story. Perhaps you remember that when I was a child, my usurping uncle Myraz got rid of seven friends of my father's, who might have taken my part, by sending them off to explore the unknown eastern seas beyond the Lone Islands. Yes, said Lucy, and none of them ever came back. Right. Well, on my coronation day, with Aslan's approval, I swore an oath that if once I would have established peace in Narnia, I would set sail east myself for a year and a day to find my father's friends, or to learn of their deaths and avenge them if I could. These were their names. The Lord Revelion, the Lord Burn, the Lord Argaz, the Lord Mavramorn, the Lord Octesian, the Lord Restimat, and... Uh, that other one, who's so hard to remember. The Lord Roop, sire, said Drinian. Uh, Roop, Roop, of course, Roop, said Caspian. That is my main intention. But Reepicheep, here he has an even higher hope. Everyone's eyes turned to the mouse. As high as my spirit, it said, though perhaps as small as my stature. Why should we not come to the very eastern end of the world? And what might we find there? I expect to find Aslan's own country. It is always from the east, across the sea, that the great lion comes to us. I say, that is an idea, said Edmund in an odd voice. But do you think, said Lucy, Aslan's country would be that sort of country? I mean, the sort you could ever sail to? I do not know, madam, said Reepicheep, but there is this. When I was in my cradle, a woodwoman, a dryad, spoke this verse over me. Where sky and water meet, where the waves grow sweet. Doubt not, Reepicheep, to find all you seek. There is the utter east. I do not know what it means, but the spell of it has been on me all my life. After a short silence, Lucy asked, And where are we now, Caspian? Well, the captain can tell you better than I, said Caspian. So Jernian got out his chair and spread it out on the table. That's our position, he said, laying his finger on it. Or was it noon today? We've had a fair wind from Care Paravel, and stood a little north for Galma, where we made on the next day. We were in port for a week, for the Duke of Galma made such a great tournament for his majesty, and there he unhorsed many knights. And got a few falls myself, Drinian. Some of the bruises are there still, put in Caspian. And unhorsed many knights, repeated Drinian with a grin. We thought the Duke would have been pleased if the King's majesty would have married his daughter, but nothing came of that. Squints and has freckles, said Caspian. Oh, poor girl, said Lucy. And we sailed from Galba, continued Drinian. 
and ran into a calm for the best part of two days and had to row, and then had wind again and did not make Terebinthia till the fourth day from Galma. And there their king sent out a warning not to land, for there was sickness in Terebinthia, but we doubled the cape and put in a little creek far from the city and watered. There we had to lie off for three days before we got a southeast wind and stood out for the seven isles. The third day out, a pirate, Terebinthian by her rig, overhauled us, but when she saw how well armed we stood off, she came shooting off arrows on either part. And we ought to have given her chase and boarded her and hanged every mother's son of them, said Reepicheep. And in five days more we were in sight of Muil, which, as you know, is the westernmost of the Seven Isles. Then we rowed through the straits and came about sundown into Red Haven on the Isle of Bryn, where we were very lovingly feast and had victuals and water at will. We left Red Haven six days ago and have made marvelously good speed, so that I hope to see the Lone Islands the day after tomorrow. The sum is, we are now nearly 30 days at sea, and have sailed more than 400 leagues from Narnia. And after the Lone Islands, said Lucy. No one knows, your majesty, answered Drinian, unless the Lone Islanders themselves can tell us. They couldn't in our days, said Edmund. Then, said Reepicheep, it is after the Lone Islands that the adventure really begins. Caspi now suggested they might like to be shown over the ship before supper, but Lucy's conscience smote her, and she said, I think I really must go and see Eustace. Sea sickness is horrid, you know. If I had my old cordial with me, I could cure him. But you have, said Caspian. I quite forgot about it. As you left it behind, I thought it might be regarded as one of the royal treasures, so I brought it. To think... It ought to be wasted on a thing like seasickness. It'll only take a drop, said Lucy. Caspian opened up one of the lockers beneath the bench and brought out the beautiful little diamond flask which Lucy remembered so well. Take back your own, queen, he said. And then they left the cabin and went out into the sunshine. In the deck there were two large long hatches, fore and aft of the mast, and both open, as they always were in fair weather, to let light and air into the belly of the ship. Caspian led them down a ladder into the a ladder into the after hatch. Here they found themselves in a place where the benches for rowing ran from side to side, and the light came in through the oar holes and danced on the roof. Of course, Caspian's ship was not that horrible thing, a galley rowed by slaves. Oars were only used when the wind failed, or for getting in and out of harbor, and everyone, except Reepicheep, whose legs were too short, had often taken a turn. At each side of the ship, the space under the benches was left clear for the rowers' feet, but all down the center there was a kind of pit that went down to the very keel, and this was filled with all kinds of things, sacks of flour, casks of water and beer, barrels of pork, jars of honey, skin bottles of wine, apples, nuts, cheeses, biscuits, turnips, sides of bacon. From the roof, well that is from the underside of the deck, hung hams and strings of onions and also the men of the watch off duty in their hammocks. Caspian led them aft, stepping from bench to bench, at least it was stepping for him, and something between a step and a jump for Lucy, and a real long jump for Reepicheep. In this way, they came to a partition with a door in it. Caspian opened the door and led them into a cabin which filled the stern underneath the deck cabins in the poop. It was, of course, not so nice. It was very low, and the sides sloped together as they went down. There was hardly any floor, and though it had windows of thick glass, they were not made to open because they were underwater. In fact, at this very moment, as the ship pitched, they were alternately golden with sunlight and dim green with the sea. You and I must lodge here, Edmund, said Caspian. We'll leave your kinsmen in the bunk and sling hat. We'll leave your kinsmen in the bunk and sling hammocks for ourselves. I beseech your majesty, cried Drinian. Nope, no, shipmate, said Caspian. We have argued all that out already. You and Rince, Rince was the mate, are sailing the ship and will have cares and labors many a night when we are singing catches or telling stories, so you and he must have the port cabin above. King Edmund and I can lie very snug here below. But how is the stranger? Eustace, very green in the face, scowled and asked whether there was any sign of the storm getting less. The Caspian said, What storm? And Drinian burst out laughing. Storm! 
storm, young master, he roared. This is as fair weather as a man could ask for. Who's that? said Eustace ir irritably. Send him away. His voice goes through my head. I brought you something that will make you feel better, Eustace, said Lucy. Oh, go away. Leave me alone, growled Eustace. But he took a drop from her flask, and though he said it was beastly stuff, the smell in the cabin when she opened it was delicious. It is certain that his face came the right color a few moments after he'd swallowed it, and he must have felt better, because instead of wailing about the storm and his head, he began demanding to be put ashore and said at the first port he would lodge a disposition against them all with the British consul. But when Reepicheep asked what a disposition was and how you lodged it, and Reepicheep thought it was some new way of arranging single combat, Eustace could only reply, Fancy not knowing that. And in the end, succeeded in convincing Eustace they were already sailing as fast as they could towards the nearest land they knew, and they had no more power of sending him back to Cambridge, which was where Uncle Harold lived, than of sending him to the moon. After that, he sulkily agreed to put on the fresh clothes which had been put out for him and come on deck. Caspian now showed them all over the ship, though indeed they had seen most of it already. They went up on the forecastle and saw the lookout man standing on a little shelf inside the, gilded, dra the gilded dragon's neck and peering through its open mouth. Inside the forecastle was the galley, or ship's kitchen, and quarters for such people as the boatswain, the carpenter, the cook, and the master archer. If you think it odd to have the galley in the bow, imagine the smoke from its chimney streaming back over the ship. That is because you are thinking of steamships, where there is always a, always a headwind. On a sailing ship, the wind is coming from behind, and anything smelly is put as far forward as possible. They were taken up to the fighting top, and at first it was rather alarming to rock to and fro there and see the deck looking small and far away beneath. You realize that if you fell, there was no particular reason why you should fall on board rather than in the sea. Then they were taken to the poop, where Rents was on duty with another man in the great tiller, and behind that, the dragon's tail rose up, covered with gilding, and round inside it ran a little bench. The name of the ship was Dawn Treader. She was only a little bit of a thing compared with one of our ships, or even with the cogs, dramans, cataracts, or galleons which Narnia had owned when Lucy and Edmund had reigned there under Peter's High King, for nearly all navigation had died out in the reigns of Caspian's ancestors. When his uncle, Myraz the Usurper, had sent the Seven Lords to sea, they had to buy Galmian ships, then man them with hired Galmian sailors. But now Caspian had begun to teach the Narnians to be seafaring folk once more, and the Dawn Treader was the finest ship he had built yet. She was so small that forward of the mast there was hardly any deck room between the central hatch and the ship's boat on one side and the hen coop. Lucy fed the hens and on the other. She was a beauty of her kind, a lady, as sailors say, her lines perfect, her colors pure, every spar and rope and pin lovingly made. Eustace, of course, would have been pleased with nothing, and kept boasting about the liners and motorboats and airplanes and submarines, as if he really knew anything about them, muttered Edmund. But the other two were delighted with the Dawn Treader, and when they returned aft to the cabin and supper, and saw the whole western sky lit up with an immense crimson sunset, felt the quiver of the ship, tasted the salt on their lips, thought of unknown lands on the eastern rim of the world, Lucy felt she was almost too happy to speak. What Eustace thought had best be told in his own words, for when they all got their clothes back dry the next morning, he at once got out a little black notebook and a pencil and started to keep a diary. He always had this notebook with him and kept a record of his marks in it, for though he didn't care much about any subject for its own sake, he cared a great deal about marks and would even go to people and say, I got so much, what did you get? But as he didn't seem likely to get many marks on the Don Treader, he now started a diary. This was the first entry. <clears throat> August 7th. Have now been 24 hours on this ghastly boat, if it isn't a dream. All the time a frightful storm has been raging. 
It's a good thing I'm not seasick. Huge waves keep coming in over the front, and I have seen the boat nearly go under any number of times. All the others pretend to take no notice of this, either from swank or because Harold says one of the most cowardly things ordinary people do is to shut their eyes to facts. It's madness to come out into sea in a rotten little thing like this. Not much bigger than a lifeboat. And of course, absolutely primitive indoors. No proper saloon, no radio, no bathrooms, no deck chairs. I was dragged all over it yesterday evening and it would make anyone sick to hear Caspian showing off his funny little toy boat as if it were the Queen Mary. I tried to tell him what real ships are like, but he's too dense. E and L, of course, didn't back me up. I suppose a kid like L doesn't realize the danger, and E is buttering up C, as everyone does here. They call him a king, and I said I was a Republican. But he had to ask what that meant. <laughs> he doesn't know anything at all! Needless to say, I've been put in the worst cabin of the boat, a perfect dungeon, and Lucy's been given a whole room on deck to herself, almost a nice room compared with the rest of this place. C says that's because she's a girl. I tried to make him see what Alberta says, that all that sort of thing is really lowering girls, but he was too dense. Still, he might see that I, too, that I shall be ill if I'm kept in that hole any longer. E says we mustn't grumble because C is sharing it with us himself to make room for L, as if that didn't make it more crowded and far worse. Nearly forgot to say there's also a kind of mouse thing that gives everyone the most frightful cheek. The others can put up with it if they like. I shall twist his tail pretty soon if he tries it on me. The food is frightful too. Well, the trouble between Eustace and Reepicheep arrived even sooner than might have been expected. Before dinner the next day, when the others were sitting round the table waiting, and being at sea gives one a magnificent appetite, Eustace came rushing in wringing his hands and shouting out, That little brute has half killed me! I insist on it being kept under control! I could bring such action against you, Caspian! I could order you to have it destroyed! The same moment, Reepicheep appeared. His sword was drawn and his whiskers looked very fierce, but he was as polite as ever. I ask your pardons all, he said and especially Her Majesty's. If I had known that he would take refuge here, I would have awaited a more reasonable time for his correction. Oh, what on earth is up, said Edmund. What had really happened was this. Reepicheep, who never felt that the ship was getting on fast enough, loved to sit on the bulwarks far forward, just beside the dragon's head, gazing out of the eastern horizon and singing softly, in his little chirping voice, the song the Dryad had made for him. He never held on to anything, however the ship pitched, and kept his balance with perfect ease. Perhaps his long tail hanging down to the deck inside the bulwarks made this easier. Everyone on board was familiar with this habit, and the, the sailors liked it, because when one was on lookout duty, it gave someone somebody to talk to. Why exactly Eustace had slipped and reeled and stumbled all the way forward to the forecastle, he had not yet got his sea legs, I never heard. Perhaps he hoped he would see land, or perhaps he wanted to hang about the galley and scrounge something. Anyway, as soon as he saw that long tail hanging down, and perhaps it was rather tempting, he thought it would be delightful to catch hold of it, swing Reepicheep round by it once or twice upside down, then run away and laugh. At first, the plan seemed more beautifully. The mouse was not much heavier than a very large cat. Eustace had him up off the rail in a trice, and very silly he looked, thought Eustace, with his little limbs all splayed out and his mouth open. But unfortunately, Reepicheep, who had fought for his life many a time, never lost his head, even for a moment, nor his skill. It is not very easy to draw one's sword when one is swinging around in the air by one's tail, but he did, and the next thing Eustace knew was two agonizing jabs in his hand, which made him let go of the tail, and the next thing after that was that the mouse had picked himself up again as if he were a ball bouncing off the deck, and there it was, facing him, and this horrid, long, bright, sharp thing like a skewer 
was waving to and fro within an inch of his stomach. This doesn't count as below the belt for mice in Narnia because they can hardly be expected to reach any higher. <laughs> Stop it! spluttered Eustace. Go away! Put that thing away! It's not safe! Stop it, I say! I'll tell Caspian! I'll have you muzzled and tied up! Why do you not draw your own sword, poltroon? cheeped the mouse. Draw and fight, or I'll beat you black and blue with the flat! I haven't got one, said Eustace. I'm a pacifist. I don't believe in fighting. Do I understand, said Reepicheep, withdrawing his sword for a moment, speaking very sternly, that you do not intend to give me satisfaction? I don't know what you mean, said Eustace, nursing his hand. If you don't know how to take a joke, I shan't bother my head about you. Then take that, said Reepicheep, and that to teach you manners, and the respect due to a knight and a mouse and a mouse's tail. And with each word, he gave Eustace a blow with the side of his rapier, which was thin, fine, dwarf-tempered steel and as supple and effective as a birch rod. Eustace, of course, was at a school where they didn't have corporal punishment, so the sensation was quite new to him. This is why, in spite of having no sea legs, it took him less than a minute to get off that forecastle and cover the whole length of the deck, burst in at the cabin door, still hotly pursued by Reepicheep. Instead, it seemed to Eustace that the rapier was well and the pursuit was hot. It might have been red hot by the feel. There was not much difficulty in settling the matter once Eustace realized that everyone took the side of a duel seriously and heard Caspian offering to lend him a sword. And Dridian and Edmund discussing whether or not he ought to be handicapped in some way to make up for being so much bigger than Reepicheep. So, he apologized sulkily and went off with Lucy to have his hand bathed and bandaged and then went to his bunk. He was careful to lie on his side. And that's the end of chapter two. So now we've heard the purpose of our adventure. There are Lords of Narnia. Now, these were Telmarine lords, but friends of Caspian's father, Caspian the King, Caspian the Ninth. And when the usurper Myraz took the throne and had his brother murdered, these loyal subjects were sent away. They, amongst everyone else, were afraid of the sea, so off they went. They were sent off on what sounded to them like an adventure, but which Myraz intended to be their doom. This was just a quick and easy way to convince people who could cause him trouble later to get themselves out of the way. Well, Caspian is now king. There's peace in Narnia. And so he's taken an oath. For these men who were not afraid of the sea, for these men who supported his father, and these men who might have supported him, he wants to give one chance to see if he can find them. So off they sail, and they've sailed now almost as far as any of them know what is still to come. No sign of these lords yet, but a whole world, all of the eastern sea, still left in front of them. And then Reepicheep. Reepicheep with that rhyme and with a hope in his heart that maybe they could sail so far they could actually find Aslan's country. It would be like sailing to heaven itself. And so here on the high seas, our Narnia adventure truly began.